this session happening with Annie Lennox, um, who is sat in front of me now. You've had quite a busy year this year, haven't you? I have indeed. I have had a busy year. It's funny because uh, a year and a half ago or so, I started thinking about uh, creating this album, Nostalgia, and it's taking me on a bit of an adventure. <laughs> But it looks, it seems as an outsider, having watched you do lots of promotion and seeing you at different times, that it's been an enjoyable journey this time. Yes. I mean, it definitely, the real love for me is, my first love is making music in the studio. That is such a joy and such a privilege. And while I'm making that music, every night when I drive home with the sort of rough uh, day of work that we've done that day, I think, and I play it back in my car, because that's where I listen to music, um, I'm always thinking, wow, this is amazing that I'm, I'm really able to do this. And it's what I wanted to do when I was a, um, a sort of in my early 20s. I thought I want to be a singer-songwriter. And that's still the joy. That is where the, the, the gold nugget lies for me. It's except with with this album, it's a covers album. It's of your interpretations of all the great um, songs from the Great right. American Songbook. So, when you were thinking about what the album was going to be that you made this time round, what what kind of what affected that decision? Why did you do this? Well, I've got a few things really. I suppose the thing was that I'd never done it. I'd never wandered into the jazz genre, the classic jazz genre. Uh, it had never really been my bag all these years. As you, you kind of, it's kind of evident for everyone to see that I'd never gone there except for one foray into Every Time We Say Goodbye, the Cole Porter song that I recorded for the Red Hot and Blue HIV AIDS project back in the 80s. And that was a joy, that was a delight to, to, to interpret that song, so beautiful. And I always thought maybe one day I might do that, but it's one of those things that you say you might do and you kind of never get round to. So I was just at a point where I actually had a clear diary and, uh, and I was thinking, right, okay, you know, what, what would I like to do? And, and this idea had been put on the shelf for some time about kind of experimenting in that genre with my voice just to put it down for posterity and see. And I started trans, um, transcribing the songs um, onto my keyboard uh, in summer, I think it was last year. And um, and then it just, it just started like that. It was just very, very personal, just me and the keyboard. So it was your decision. And did you find, was it easy to do? Was your voice, mm. did it actually come quite naturally? Mm. I loved it. I loved singing these songs. They're, they're, they're incredible. You can see why they're part of the classic American songbook, mm. because they are simply quintessential songs, each one of them. And, um, and it's a joy as a, and a privilege as a singer to be able to go there and actually to record. I just thought, for posterity, this is an interesting project. Mm. And but daunting as well, because you are up against some amazing voices, the definitive versions. Well, I suppose I'm foolish enough to rush in where angels fear to tread, you know. And that is always the thing that I love a challenge. And um, it could have been daunting, but because it was so personal and private and I was loving it so much, I didn't allow the fear of what the, rem you know, what kind of retribution I'm... <laughs> <laughs> might come hammering down on me by jazz purists, you know. Mm. There's always the critic out there, ever present, ever waiting to hammer you. So Does that still puncture? Do it you? does, deeply. Okay. It does. It, it deeply punctures. It shouldn't, but it does. I'm just that, I'm not going to deny it. I think most of us creatives have to go through rings of fire and it's painful. I mean, maybe some people have thicker skin. I don't, quite frankly. It hurts and... I go away and sort of lick my wounds and then um, try to get over it. D do you question yourself? Does it, yeah, always. I mean, deeply knock your confidence? Totally. Always. I always. It always has. Yes. Constantly. But because of my love of making music, I've sort of bounced back again. And it's a funny dichotomy, really, or a bit of a dilemma in a way, because what you love is also the thing that will pay into your lack of confidence. So on the one hand, I am supremely confident. When, it takes a lot of guts to, to do uh, what you do as a performer. Absolutely. You have to have a lot of self-belief. But I think you'll find if you speak with a majority of performers, if they're really honest with you, they do have a lot of confidence, but they also have the opposite as well. It coexists. Mm. Yeah, just deep insecurity. And so for somebody to then kind of to back up the insecurity that you have, it's you, I guess you're just thinking, well, I was right or yeah. wrong. I can't do this. And the criticism is fine to a degree, but the nastiness is truly not. And, and it's very vicious out there. 
It's mm. a it's a vicious place. And uh, do you think it's got worse? Yes, you, uh, absolutely. Because okay. everybody's got a platform now. Everybody's a critic, so anybody can write a blog and post it on Facebook and Twitter, and they can say whatever they like, and they can be anonymous as well. Mm. So, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so you can be much Whoa. more vicious. Oh yeah, no holds barred vicious. So you know, do you know what? I think at the end of the day. It's all a good lesson. I mean, I'm a very grounded person and I have no illusions about my strengths and weaknesses. And so, you know, I'm just grounded and I know I don't think too highly of myself in that respect. So I think it's good. I've, I've met people whose egos have gone through the roof and, 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 you know, it's very obvious. And so people around are like, whoa, you, you're a little bit of a megalomaniac. It's very evident, you know. It's a little bit like plastic surgery when you can see it t- for 10 miles off. <laughs> Right, let's have some music from you now then. The first track that you'll play tonight and you're going to do Summertime. It's Annie Lennox on Radio 2. beautiful summertime from Annie Lennox and Annie is here with us for um, for ages yeah which is great we're going to play one of your song choices now um, so something that you love we've gone for the Supremes and oh, a very good choice yeah indeed okay tell us what it is about the Supremes and baby love that you enjoy. well you know hearing women's voices coming from Motown back in the day um, when I did in the late six late 60s and I was very very young just barely even a teenager 
there was something so so thrilling about those three part harmonies and these beautiful elegant women with coiffed hair and gorgeous dresses think, singing and dancing it was just m- magnetic and um what can you say i mean they had this i mean everything about motown to me is just extraordinary and i mean they, they weren't called the supremes for nothing it couldn't be that a title, could it? Not really. Let's play it. This is The Supremes. That was that was what music could explain. Annie is with us tonight, and uh, you love that song. You love that Absolutely. band. Absolutely. Oh, God. I mean, you know, when music is just great, and it kind of just <gasps> takes your breath away, um, there's nothing like it. <laughs> there's nothing like it. That track is so extraordinary and amazing and powerful and energetic. What can you say? I just love the Rolling Stones. You still, obviously, su- you know, you will always be a music lover. If one, once a music fan, always a music fan. What music excites you at the moment? When do you hear yeah. things? And just well, go, wow. I'm going to clarify this. I think I'm entitled to do it. Um, it's funny. I lived with music and every kind of, kind of type, and I have very, very eclectic taste. And it started when I was just a very young girl, and I heard things on the radio, and you know, and then on the television, and the top of the pops and the charts, and everything that influenced me through that time and then through the 70s when everything went so radically up up 10 gears and it, you just felt that that was that was what music could explain your life you were looking to music to sort it out to state it and you kind of i live with it in, in a day and night and what happened really was that in the 1990s i had children and i adore my kids and um Somehow or another, the the effect of be, becoming a mother, which is just so brilliant, I think it's an evolution. And I ceased to have the same kind of relationship to music. And I'm just think I've been thinking about this retrospectively. Like, why is it I don't listen to music in the way that I used to? It's really because I'm not the same person that I was when I was a young per, younger person. I'm, I'm no longer a young person, but. This uh, becoming an adult, a real adult, loving children and uh, being a parent uh, was a huge evolution for me. Mm. And um, and I realised that whatever it was in youth culture that I had been so identified with until I was about 40 had ceased to interest me in the same kind of way. And I thought that's okay mm. because it's a choice, isn't it? And also that my daughters are now in their early 20s and you know I think it's their time I think it is generational and I think that we go through maybe like decades where like as I say if my kids are 10 they'll be listening to certain kind of music and I'd be I'd be hearing what they're listening to at 10 and then at 20 I'm although I can love music if somebody plays me a track and I don't know who they are but I think the music's fantastic that's great but I'm not seeking a meaning in life like I was through music anymore but being so being in a different place um in your life now is there a different sort of music that really speaks to you because you know music means more to you when you go through different things like when you fall in love and i know you're you're very loved up um so is that music that you (laughs) really connect with i saw you together just (laughs) i'm very loved up yes i guess i am but you Um. you know is is there a different kind of music that suits your emotions now and the the stage of life that you're at see i'm a very quiet person actually and when i i spend so much time making music and performing like in with nostalgia it's sort of taken takes up all my mind energy and what i kind of really love most of all is just being really really quiet and kind of appreciating being in the moment and what i find never and it's not a criticism but with music you know i like to select it and it has to be appropriate so like when i'm in a in a car um, no when i'm in a restaurant and they're playing some mu- music that's not of my choice and i can't hear the people next to me and we can't have a conversation i kind of find that's an inappropriate use of music for me i you know it, it's so meaningful to me like if i hear music i have to respond to it it actually really affects me mm. and so music's out there selling things such a lot and is for sale and it sounds again ironic but for me to be saying this but I just um, I appreciate music in a different sort of way I suppose that's what it is it's just um, I like making it and I like silence and it's generational and ex- experiential and and it's okay so I'm not in touch completely with everything that's happening and it's so much of a surfeit of it right now that it's like I think it's appropriate where I'm at Let's have another track now. Um, the next song you're going to do is I Put a Spell on You. Why did you choose this song? I think I chose all the songs on the album because I just intuitively heard them and responded. 
and you just know when you hear a song it's like it's like looking at um, something that you want to experience as a performer and you try it and you know if it's something that you feel you can do something with and 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 making nostalgia was not about covering songs for me it, making nostalgia was about interpreting them and that's such a different thing because covering them is karaoke and anybody can do karaoke but what i wanted to do was to, to make them mine in a way to make the interpretations mine and whether whether people love it or hate it that's what i try to do and and i think that it's the best uh, representation of that that i could put forward Obviously, otherwise I, would, I wouldn't have released it, you know. <laughs> I would have uh, kept working on it until I thought it was good enough. <laughs> Let's hear it now. This is Annie and I put a spell on you. I put a spell on you Because You better stop the things you do I tell you I ain't lying I ain't lying You know I can't stand it You're running around You know better daddy I can't stand it Cause you put me It's Radio 2, we're at Maida Vale and enjoying a session from Annie Lennox at the moment. Um, we were talking earlier on about the, the chatter that goes on all the mm. time and it does almost feel like the world is speeding up, but yeah. there is so much going on all the time. It's That's kind of it. an assault on the senses. I'm, I'm really glad you said that because nostalgia is partly about that. The title is partly addressing that. that, that I've come to a stage where I feel so overstimulated and that was what I was referring to when I talk about the silence I feel so overstimulated by everything which I love of course like we all do we love the frenzy but at the other side of it is that I want I want to sort of slow it down and I want 
uh, to turn around and sometimes go back because I miss my childhood and I miss my grandparents and I miss my parents and I miss the conversations that we'll ne- I'll never have again. N- none of us ever will. Mm. We'll never ever be able to turn the clock back. That is the extraordinary mystery of existence is that we're all only in the present moment and the past is gone. It's gone. Mm. But it's, it remains in your, in your memory and that is what nostalgia is. It's that longing for uh, to co- for connection with the past or maybe home or something that makes you feel like okay this is a good warm fuzzy feeling and um, but actually again saying that huh, some of these songs are not so warm and fuzzy and mm. they are um, you know r- written in a time in the 1930s back in the America before the civil rights movement and uh, again this theme of, of human difficulties in life uh, the, the combative thing that we express constantly through racism, bigotry, hatred, you know, the differences that are expressed in violence. You know, that theme was car- was then and it's carried on now and, and, it's, and it continues ad infinitum. Mm. I was um, interviewed Lord uh, a couple of weeks ago now. Um, it, is she someone that you are a fan of? Do you know um, so Well, much I know her? of her. I do know of her. It was and in- she is a remarkable, I mean, amazing young woman. Yeah, 18 years old, oh. just 18 years old. And such wisdom that she has about her. Yeah. And she was saying that it does feel like there's a whole generation at the moment who um, are very confident and really empowered and almost empowered by the internet and by being able to be in contact with each other and just all growing up with that. Yeah, and but I they thought also that was interesting. Have, mm, but they also have the huge... Uh, sense of um, difficulty with all of the internet as well because because you know the sense of insecurity that you don't have enough Facebook friends and that your your hair isn't long enough or short enough or your body isn't skinny enough or or curvy enough or all of those things that we've all I mean I've been there I know exactly what that feels like but I think that it's really been ramped up and multiplied over the last two decades Mm. just just it's off the scale okay let's play some more music um otis redding should we play otis yeah redding? Let's, let's play, play some otis, otis redding. redding beautiful let's otis redding and it was doc of the bay annie lennox is here with us at the moment you, you've spoken out about twerking let's just get this have a chat about the um your, your why views do we on... have to talk about twerking let's talk about feminism i think okay. that's a better i think that's a better subject yeah you know the, the thing is that is that everybody's so obsessed with this very superficial thing this nonsense thing and they actually don't really want to address the real issues and that's what frustrates me hugely okay the real issues being the real issues are about women and girls and equal rights and opportunities for um women in developing countries as far as i can see to have access to education and sexual and reproductive health care and protection and when you look into women's issues there's just endless amounts of issues and topics that you can go but do you, you know. not think there's there's more awareness nowadays that women are in a stronger position that the people are being more vocal there are stronger role models well, in um, developed countries probably okay um to be honest for the last four years i mean and i've been a little bit of a contributor to, to some of these events you know we've been trying to get the word feminism reappraised and we've tried to get it um into the zeitgeist and um and i would say that you know i've got a wonderful photograph from a magazine rack where the three three magazines side by side each one has the word feminist on the front. Now, I'm encouraged by that because four years ago, they were not interested in discussing the issue of feminism whatsoever. So that's grand. But discussion is one thing, but actually application and changes in law and real transformative change, uh, that, that is some way to go. So um, I think it's great if we can have the co- conversations and the dialogues. And But I think it's sad when we get polarised and we start fighting over things. And it is a complex issue. I know that. What I really want to see are, are actual practical changes and uh, evolution for women. I, I think that feminism has got a long way to go. Right. Will you play some more for us, please?
Annie Lennox and that was Georgia on my mind um, it's been lovely having you here today you've, you've said that you haven't written songs because you are so happy do you do you write nothing at all do you ever write words do you have any books where you write down notes that will one day become your own songs see it's so interesting isn't it I'm going to be 60 in December and I'm I, f- I feel really grateful to be up to this point relatively healthy and well and still singing and doing things that you know I did back in my 20s actually um and things have changed and they must change. They, you must evolve. It would be inappropriate for me to be the person I was back in the 80s or 90s or even at the turn of the century, you know, <laughs> the century. Mm. <laughs> i tell you what, we'll play another track that I know that you like, Cocteau Twins. Oh, I love the Cocteau Twins. Yeah. Okay, what, what is it about the Cocteau Twins? That- they're ephemeral and uh, mystical and they're just transporting. The, the music of the Cocteau Twins is just absolutely original and and pure and I just I've always adored it it kind of takes you into another zone instantly let's play it this is Ivo <laughs> 